Hello, I'm in the middle of prototyping some new high power electronic test systems for our lab at the moment. And as part of that system, we need a 60 watt mains power supply. And I thought I'd design our own. As part of that power supply, we need to design a custom transformer. And I thought it might be quite cool to show you how I've gone about prototyping this in the lab to make sure it works before we actually send it out for manufacture. I hope you enjoy the video. Winding prototype magnetics can be tedious, so for the custom ETD34 part today, I have support from our friendly lab dog, Jasper. The transformer is required to have a primary magnetizing inductance of 700 microhenries whilst supporting worst case winding currents of 560 milliamps RMS in the primary and 3.9 amps RMS in the secondary. The prototype uses a margin wound construction where a barrier tape is wound at each side of the winding with sleeving over the winding ends to maintain 6mm creepage between primary and secondary sides. It is also possible to use triple insulated wire on the secondary to allow the margin tape to be removed. As you can see, the primary winding has been split into two parts with the secondary sandwiched in between. This interleaved approach helps to reduce leakage inductance and keep efficiency high. Firstly, we add margin tape to either side of the bare bobbin. This ensures that when we add the windings, we maintain 6mm creepage between primary and secondary. Now we add the first 25 turns of 0.5mm wire of the primary. We choose 25 turns here to fully fill a single layer and ensure a flat surface for the layers to be wound on top. We now wrap the winding with three layers of insulation tape and further margin tape on top of that at each side of the winding area. Note that for the actual windings we maintain the same winding direction with the start of the winding nominated as the dot end. This ensures we always have the correct winding polarity. We now wind the nine secondary turns as two layers across and back. The secondary winding comprises five parallel strands of 0.5mm wire, which we wind as a flat ribbon winding to do the best job we can of providing a flat winding surface for the windings to fit on top. Another three layers of insulation tape and margin tape is applied. Even though the secondary winding was a bit bumpy, the insulation tape does help to smooth things out. We now wind the remaining 16 primary turns of 0.5mm wire. Starting on pin 2 and finishing on pin 1, we try to spread the winding over the available width. It's not too bad. Ok, stick with me here. After a break for a cup of tea and to stroke Jasper, we now add 3 layers of insulation tape and the margin tape at each side of the bobbin. Finally, we wind the four bias windings of 0.5mm wire, starting on pin 6 and finishing on pin 7. We try to spread these over the winding width to keep the coupling reasonable to the secondary. More insulation tape is applied and we check to see that the ferrite core can fit in place. So, we now have all the wires fitted, but things are a bit of a mess. We need to trim the wires to length and electrically connect to the transformer pins. The copper wire we used has an enamel insulation, which can be burned off with a soldering iron, but care must be taken not to overheat the transformer pins, since the plastic bobbin can be damaged. Also, be careful not to place too much force on the pins, since the bobbin can snap. This is the prototype with the pins terminated. In a flyback transformer, the air gap in the magnetic circuit is where energy is stored during the on time of the primary switch. This energy is released to the secondary when the primary switch turns off. We need to gap the centre leg of the transformer, so we use a small needle file to grind away ferrite material bit by bit. We actually need to set the gap to give the required primary magnetising inductance of 700 microhenries, with a tolerance of plus and minus 10%. Our calculations indicate this should be around 0.24 millimetres, so we remove ferrite material a little at a time and measure using the impedance breach to see if we are close enough. And there we go, 713 microhenries is within specification for our primary magnetising inductance. 
With this ETD34 bobbin, we use metal clips to hold the cores in place. The forces exerted by these clips cause the air gap to reduce slightly, and this gives a slightly higher magnetising inductance of 728 microhenries. It's still in spec though. With the core halves in place, we add copper tape around the outside of the core and solder the ends in place. This serves two purposes. Firstly, it creates a shorted turn to any stray magnetic fields outside the main magnetic circuit of the transformer. This helps to reduce these stray fields coupling into other circuitry and creating noise. Secondly, the ferrite core is conductive and the high dV by dt voltages on the windings will capacitively couple currents onto the ferrite core. By grounding the flux band back to the primary side, the noise currents are shunted back to the primary side with low impedance, which prevents the core material from radiating noise. We have already measured the primary magnetising inductance at 728 microhenries, which is in spec. This is just the inductance of the primary winding with all other windings open circuit. However, it's also useful to measure the primary reference leakage inductance, and we can do this by measuring the inductance of the primary with all other windings short circuited. To short circuit the secondary and bias windings, I use a couple of old pieces of solder braid to bond the pins together. Using the impedance bridge, we measure the primary reference leakage inductance as 4.4 microhenries, which is great since it is tiny in comparison to the magnetizing inductance. The split primary approach is helping us here. Note the measurement frequency of 100 kHz. Due to skin and proximity effects, the effective resistance of the windings at the normal operating frequency of 70 kHz will be much higher than the DC resistance of the windings. Whilst there are a number of ways to model this, I find a good starting point is to measure the DC resistance and then assume a certain multiplier when then considering winding losses. The best thing is to test in practice and see how hot the part becomes.